Our next presenter is Lillian Johnson. Lillian Johnson graduated with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Environmental Science and Policy from St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas. In 2017, she joined the Revised Total Call for Rural Program as an NRS3, and in June 2021, she joined the Lead and Copper Monitoring Program, where she serves as the Natural Resource Specialist, focusing on action level exceedance ALE requirements and implementation of new Lead and Copper, copper Rural Revision, LCRR. Please welcome Lillian Johnson. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the PDW Conference. It's always a pleasure to connect with y'all each year, but especially this year as there's so many changes happening. Um, my name is Lillian Johnson, and I am a Compliance Officer for the Lead and Copper Monitoring Team in the Water Supply Division of the TCEQ. In this presentation, I'm going to outline, uh, outline and lay the groundwork for the lead and copper rule revisions and the initial lead service line inventory. So please note these acronyms, LCRR and LSLI, I'll refer to them as such throughout the presentation. Uh, quick question, who in this room has begun their lead service line inventory? Awesome, amazing. Who has completed their lead service line inventory? Got a few, awesome, great job, okay. So here's my contact information and a brief outline uh, of the presentation. We'll first cover some introductions and uh, purpose of this presentation. We'll go, over, we'll go over LSLI definitions. We will discuss methods of the LSLI submission. We'll walk through the initial LSLI requirements, talk about LCRR steps that you should complete right now, and go over any questions you have at the end. So the purpose of this presentation is so that you can walk away from this room being able to understand the time frame of the LCRR and LCRI key events, define and describe LCRR terminology and service line configurations. You'll be able to walk away ready to complete the uh, all initial lead service line inventory requirements, and finally how to navigate to the guidance and assistance resources available to you. So right after this presentation, my supervisor, Seth Kramer, will be presenting on the lead and copper rule improvements, or the LCRI, but I want to quickly outline some key events here of the LCRR and the LCRI. So the compliance date of the LCRR, meaning the date that all systems must comply with the LCRR, is October 16th of 2024. Requirements for that due date are the initial lead service line inventory, public notification for affected customers identified in the LSLI, and 24-hour public notification for action level exceedances. We'll discuss this a little bit in the, in, later in this presentation, and Seth Kramer will also go into this. The proposed LCRI language was announced on November 30th, 2023, with an expected finalization date of, uh, before October 16th of 2024. The compliance date and the date that all systems must comply with the LCRI requirements will be three years after the final publication date of the LCRI. So before we dive in, let's go over some definitions that we need to become familiar with. So the lead service line means a portion of pipe that is made of lead, which connects the water main to the building inlet. A lead service line may be owned by the water system, owned by the property owner or both. Where a building is not present, the service line connects the water main to the drinking water outlet. A galvanized service line means iron or steel piping that has been dipped in zinc to prevent corrosion and rusting. Now galvanized requiring replacement is a new term that we see in LCRR, and it means a galvanized service line that is or ever was at any time downstream of a lead service line or is currently downstream of an unknown service line. For community systems, a GRR, or galvanized requiring replacement service line, would be demonstrated with a private side galvanized service line and a public side service line of lead or unknown status. Lead status unknown service line is a service line that has not been demonstrated to meet or not meet the definition of lead free. Non-lead service line is a service line that has been determined through evidence-based record, method, or technique not to be lead or galvanized requiring replacement. 
Gooseneck, pigtail, or connector means a short section of piping used for connections between rigid service piping. And at this time, connectors are not required to be included in the uh, initial lead service line inventory, but may be included in the LCRI proposed baseline inventory. For the purposes of the initial lead service line inventory, lead connectors do not count towards the definition of a lead service line. So this image right here was developed by the TCEQ and shows key features of a drinking water service line for a community public water system. Please note the delineation between the public and the private sides of this service line. Now this image was developed by the EPA and it is included in the EPA's regulatory guidance for small water systems. This shows an example of a community water system where there is a master meter and multiple service lines. Examples of this configuration can include apartment complexes or uh, shopping centers. This image shows three separate customer-owned service lines with the same system-owned service line. The system would identify all three service lines on the initial lead service line inventory. This image, also developed by the EPA, uh, is also included in the small systems guidance. This shows a few examples of a non-transient, non-community uh, service line configuration. Service lines are shown from the water well to the building inlet, from pressure tank to building inlet, and shows that distribution lines between buildings are considered service lines that must be inventoried. So now we're going to move on to discussing the LCRR initial lead service line inventory. This citation, citation the Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, 4141-84, outlines requirements for lead service line inventories and material categorization. Inventories must include all service lines connected to the distribution system, regardless of ownership. Service lines must be categorized in the following manner, either lead, galvanized requiring replacement, lead status unknown, where again there is no documented evidence supporting material classification, or non-lead, where the service line is determined, again through evidence-based record, method, or technique, not to be lead or galvanized requiring replacement. So all systems regulated under the current LCR are also regulated under the LCRR and are required to submit the initial lead service line inventory. Um, again, by October 16th of 2024. All community and non-transient non-community water systems are required to submit this initial lead service line inventory even if the system confirms all service lines are non-lead. So October 16th, 2024 is going to be here before we know it. Um, if you haven't started working on the initial lead service line inventory, start now. Um, don't wait for the publication of the LCRI uh, to begin developing your service line inventory. The TCQ does not encourage the PWS to submit the inventory early if the public water system still has unknown service lines. So systems should work on to confirm all service line material classification before submission if possible, but of course unknown is an acceptable categorization. So this slide outlines the two methods of submission for the initial lead service line inventory. One method of submission of the LSLI is sending the TCEQ form 20943 to the proxy email box lcrr at tceq.texas.gov. You will receive a response email stating that your submission has been received, and one of our compliance officers will confirm if the LSLI has been accepted for compliance or if there are any changes that need to be made. If you've already submitted your Form 20943 and received confirmation of compliance, fantastic. You can continue to use 20943 and update it as needed until October 16th of 2024. The other method of delivery that we're introducing today is the, um, lead the upcoming lead service line inventory portal. We are thrilled to announce this new user-friendly online portal, which will allow users to create a profile for their water system, upload lead service line inventory required information, and update the inf information quickly and efficiently. The portal is currently in a testing environment right now. More information will be made available on the LSLI portal as it is um, made available to us. Of course, there's going to be training and assistance made available as well. So for the next several slides, we will now move on to discussing the required elements of the initial lead service line inventory. 
Whether you use TCEQ Form 20943 or the online LSLI portal, these listed elements are required to be included in the initial LSLI. This slide includes the required PWS information, including water system name, ID, population served, number of service connections, PWS type, and PWS contacts. So again, whether you are using Form 20943 or the LSLI portal, systems must certify that they have reviewed all historical uh, water system records and describe the records that are reviewed. The types of records that are required to be reviewed are listed here. Previous material evaluation, construction records and plumbing codes, other water system records, and distribution system inspections. So here are some important things to keep in mind when working on the review of historical records. All water system records are required to be reviewed. The takeaway from this slide is that you need to get really creative with record review if the system has limited or no historical records. The system can include tax codes and appraisals in the record review. Systems can interview senior personnel and put that information into an affidavit that will now be a water system record. Systems should use all past and current maintenance and plumbing records. And as a reminder, any service lines constructed and installed after the Texas lead ban of July 1st, 1988, are likely non-lead when reviewed against all water system records and the Texas lead ban ordinance. So currently there are only two approved methods of verifying the material classification of service lines in the distribution system. Historical record review is again required and approved as a method, a method to confirm service line material. Visual inspection is also approved as a method to confirm service line material, but it is not required at this time and does not replace the requirement to complete the record review. So please note that all methods of verification other than historical record review and visual inspected inspection are not approved by the TCEQ and cannot be used to confirm the material classification of service lines. So listed here are some examples of verification methods that are not approved. Predictive or statistical modeling, machine learning, metal detectors, swordfish probe technology, water sampling, and any other artificial intelligence. So systems must confirm if the submission is initial or, um, or an inventory update. Systems must also confirm who owns the service lines in distribution, whether they are entirely owned by the water system, entirely owned by the customer, or if the ownership is split between the water system and the customer. So for the detailed inventory portion of Form 20943 and the LSLI portal, systems must include information for all required fields listed here. Location identification, system-owned service line classification, customer-owned service line classification, entire service line material classification. And in addition to the required fields of the detailed inventory, there are conditionally required fields depending on the information provided. You may need to confirm if the system-owned service line was ever previously led, the service line installation date, building type, and any other lead sources including solders or connectors. For the public accessibility requirement of the initial lead service line inventory, all systems must confirm the location identifiers that are used for each service line and that all service lines including, in, include a location identification. Systems must also state and confirm how the inventory must be made publicly accessible through one of the allowable methods of public accessibility. For the certification requirements of the initial lead service line inventory, the PWS representative must certify under penalty of law that all information submitted for the LSLI um, is true and accurate to the best of their ability. The PWS representative must certify each of the required statements on Form 20943 or the LSLI portal. So next steps, public water systems must continue to comply with the current lead and copper rule up until the LSL LCRR compliance date of October 16th, 2024. Guidance on rule transition and detailed LCRR requirements will be published by the EPA in the lead and copper rule improvements prior to October 16th of 2024. 
TCEQ, of course, will relay all EPA, LCRR, and LCRI information on the TCEQ LCRR webpage, and we will continue to provide presentations, webinars, trainings, and guidance as they are developed. Again, here are the other LCRR requirements that will be implemented by the compliance date of October 16th, 2024. A public notice is required to be distributed to all affected customers identified in the LSLI. All consumers at locations with lead, galvanized requiring replacement, and unknown service lines should receive a public notice within 30 days of the PWS submitting the LSLI to the TCEQ. A public notification is required to be distributed to PWS consumers if a lead action level exceedance is reported to the TCEQ. All consumers of the PWS should receive uh, the public notice and public education within 24 hours of the, PW of the PWS learning of the lead action level exceedance. So what to work on now? As a reminder, water systems must continue to comply with LCR as it, cr as it, as it is currently written. Um, and all water systems should read the published LCRR and the EPA guidance on developing and maintaining a service line inventory. Both documents are available on the TCEQ LCRR webpage. To begin developing the service line inventories, systems should prioritize historical record review over excavation or other investigative methods and begin filling out the TCEQ initial lead service line form 20943 and stay up to date on the proposed or the uh, lead service line inventory portal. Water systems could begin proactive replacement of lead service lines in distribution, but should do so under EPA guidance to prioritize public health and safety. There are funding opportunities and technical assistance available for these projects. Lastly, all water systems should always maintain corrosion control to ensure that they are providing safe and reliable drinking water to their consumers. So here are some additional resources listed. Um, these resources, Resources are also available on our TCQ LCRR webpage where you can find um, inventory form 20943 and EPA guidance on developing and maintaining a service line inventory. Please do not try to print the uh, form 20943. If the system wants a printed version of the LSLI, the system should use the LSLI investigative standard operating procedure, which can be found on, again, the TCQ LCRR webpage. This SOP includes a printable version of the detailed inventory that operators can keep in their truck for visual inspection. And additional resources list are listed here. These resources are also available on the TCEQ LCRR webpage where you can find, uh, again, for 20943. With that, are there any questions? <laughs> I've got a few questions. I see one question over here. I get a lot of questions because I'm a TCEQ, uh, well, I'm, I'm a TEEX instructor, and my question is this, how detrimental is lead and copper when it comes to health issues? I know that lead does affect the thinking of younger people, but my thought is this, is, is it gotten to the point to where it is that detrimental to people's health that we have to go to this extent to uh, investigate each of these systems and each of these residents and their connections uh, to the uh, distribution system. I have not found uh, that much of a detriment uh, through my investigation on uh, websites as to it's come to the point of creating some kind of a pandemic. Well, yes, the EPA and the TCEQ have determined that this is a extreme threat to um, both young children and their developing brains and pregnant women. Um, and it, EPA has determined that it is a requirement for us to, to identify these lead service lines and limit the exposure of lead to young children. Where, where can you find these specific health effects concerning that? Yeah, great question. So EPA has a fantastic website on the health effects of lead. If you just Google EPA lead in drinking water, it will take you to a wonderful webpage. Okay, thank you. I have a question where um, it's, I guess it's on page seven of the stuff I printed out. It state how the inventory will be pub made publicly accessible. 
So we take that spreadsheet that we have filled out and somehow we have to make that publicly accessible? So you don't have to make the entire uh, inventory publicly accessible, the entire form 20943, but you have to make the, um, the classification publicly accessible to, um, to whoever is interested in knowing that information. Only yes. if they ask for it? Well, for um, systems that are over 50,000, you have to make it publicly accessible on their web page. Um, but yes. Yeah. I mean, a lot of our systems have 70 connections. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, mean, I don't have to do anything unless they ask about it? The requirement is that you make it publicly accessible to the consumers. Oh, sorry. Can you, the, your question is, uh, if you posted the inventory in a town square, is that making it public access? You'd have to keep it there forever. So if anyone asks for it, if it's going to permanently live in the town square. Right, that's separate than, yeah, require, notice, uh, notifying your customers. That's, that's different than other public notice requirements. The accessibility requirement is separate from those. Making the results of the inventory of the line uh, especially if it's uh, negative on both lead and copper, that it's all built after the date, not, it's all been confirmed being PVC, do you still have to notify the, the customers? Of, are yes. you referring to the lead consumer notice after samples yes, are taken? Yes, the, the, the consumer notice. Yes, the lead consumer notice is, is remaining. So that would have to be, even if there was no positives, or it's all non-lead. Right, right. If you're referring to the lead consumer notice, that is separate than the public notification to affected customers of the lead service line inventory. So the public notice to affected customers of the lead service line inventory is only required for consumers at locations of lead, galvanized requiring replacement, and unknown. And you know what, I'm going to step in a second because I want, I want to talk for a second. My name is Seth Kramer and I'm the team leader for the lead and copper monitoring team. And I do want to address your uh, question about the health effects of lead and who it actually affects. Um, it has been shown at this point that there is no level of lead that is, a, uh, that is of any health advantage to any human being, okay? Um, as you get older, it's going to sequester inside your bones because it's a calcium analog. And it will actually start to leach back out during osteoporosis. It causes uh, kidney uh, issues. It causes renal issues. It causes um, high blood pressure. It is known to cause um, ADD and other uh, behavioral problems in people who are in their adolescent years. There is, a, there is and has been for a very long time a consideration that somehow this is only uh, something that affects infants and children and maybe some pregnant women. Simply not the case. The, the number of health effects of lead just, it runs the full gamut. There's not a single bit of it that's good for you. So to address your question about is it worth going through everything to do it, that's a tough one for me to answer for you, honestly. It is an awful lot that's being asked to do it, but I can tell you, reducing your exposure, your personal exposure to lead in drinking water is something that we can control. We can't necessarily control your exposure to it in the foods that you eat. Someone else has got to do that or the air that you're breathing, or the things that you touch, right, that absorb through your skin or you might put in your mouth. We can't do much about that, but in the drinking water world, we can. So I just wanted to touch on that because we get this question a lot, and I've heard it a lot over the years. I just want to go ahead and clear it up a little bit. It really is a serious enough issue for anyone of any age that you should, you should take, it, uh, take it seriously. I, I understand, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why the EPA's TA assistance is out there. Um, to help provide and link people with those resources to go ahead and make these type of adjustments and changes. And you're right, what is the financial burden? Um, there are reports that have been done out there. So w before the EPA passes these rules, they look at those cost-benefit analysis. And they do, uh, I remember sending it on a webinar where someone had, um, what they'd done is they looked at what would be the cost of having everyone implement the treatment rules versus say, let's just put a filter in everyone's single person's home and have them pay for you know, replacing filters in perpetuity, right? Uh, surprisingly, the cost analysis has came kind of similar on that, right? Um, but overall, the actual cost of lost productivity, lost IQ, the health effects and all those, it, it surmounts. It's incredibly expensive to have people um, sickened by 
something like lead, right? So it is a lot, and I do understand it's a lot to ask systems to do that, but the funding resources are available. I, I don't have the money to do it myself, and that's why I still have galvanized pipe in my 1939 home. Um, but fortunately, as a water system, you're not required to actually replace the pipes in somebody's home, though. So. And I do encourage you to, to check out and take advantage of these resources listed here. The Texas Water Development Board and TCEQ has free assistance available to you as well. Well, you know, it depends if you get approved for that assistance by Texas Water Development Board. Yeah. So trust me, a lot of them are not getting approved. 1.1 million is that I have to invest. It, it will be a years long, Texas yeah. Water Development Board has a years long yeah. program for it yeah, as well. Yeah, we're trying. Yeah. So the question that I have is this, and you made a very good point. My service tab, I can guarantee, has no lead and copper. But the line going to the customer's home possibly does. So whose responsibility is it to replace that line? Is the public water system's, it will so ultimately be the public water system's responsibility to replace that line. Question. I want you to explain that to me and what authority I have to do that because that in that case, I will have to acquire a utility easement. Who's going to pay for that? Yeah, so under LCRI, the, the proposed LCRI right now, you do need the, the, uh, the customer's um, allowance to replace their side of the line. If, if, they they don't don't allow it, if they don't allow it, you have to document that you attempted okay. Okay. to reach them. Um, right. so now we're going to have to do line acquisitions and utility easements just in order to replace because right. our, and this is what we don't, I don't agree and I might be talking for everyone else. We public water systems do not agree our system, our service stops at the meter period. Right. Why are we going inside private property? By God, I think that's terrible. There's more stuff in our water and the things that we consume in foods that do more harm. Yeah. So that's my point. I understand your frustration. And also it depends on the, uh, it depends on the local uh, local areas and local governance. Um, some folks do have, uh, they do have those rights to get inside people. Okay. I have a follow-up question, please. Um, are we to make the entire classification publicly available of the service line, or can we just tell them what's on the city side and the customer side of the meter, or do we actually have to put the entire EPA classification online? Great question. Yeah, so the public side and the customer side, they will, um, be calculated to have an entire service line material classification. So the entire material service line classification is ultimately what is going to be reported um, as the summary, and that's going to be required to um, be made publicly available. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask, when was predictive modeling removed as an option? Because when this was initially discussed, that was one of the options on the EPA uh, forms that was released. Yeah, predictive modeling has never been approved by the TCEQ um, as a method of verification. So it's okay with EPA, but it's not okay with TCEQ? At, at this point, it is not approved by TCEQ. Um, we are in communication with EPA, Office of Research and Development, um, in discussion with that, um, but at this point, it's not approved by the TCEQ. It's Hi, Lillian. I'm over here. Hi. Hey. Hi. We having fun yet? <laughs> yeah. uh, real quick question. So you, you mentioned briefly about older water systems. My water system started before Texas was a state. So you said get creative with the records. Right. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? And then can you yeah. tell me, um, you said that the visual inspections will suffice as a, a method, correct? Visual inspection is approved as so a if, method, yes. Because that's what we're doing. We rented a machine. We're going through everything in town that we... It, okay, so the only record we really used was the CAD record, right? Right. We know what year every facility was built. We have no idea what people didn't, if they replaced their own line, if they had low water pressure. What, what, we don't know. We can't find right. that. So can you go into creative just a little deeper? Yeah, so please? when I say, you know, creative is that EPA is requiring your review of all available historical records. If you have no records to review, then you have no records to review, but you have to make a good faith effort to review all available historical record information. Um, so again, the, the senior personnel uh, interviews, of course you may not have senior personnel from, <laughs> Right. Um, let's see, county appraisal district um, information. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, other creative, um, let's see, other creative things. We've talked about um, 
senior personnel, investigative methods, um, of course, installation records, tap cards, plumbing codes, uh, recent, you know, plumbing codes. I mean, I, sorry, I think I speak for everyone here when we're just, we know how this works. We turn it in, it gets kicked back. We turn it in, it gets kicked back. We're just trying to get ahead of how many times it gets kicked back. So if there's things we need to put in, I don't have historical records. I don't have tap right. cards. I don't have, the old timers are gone. That's why I have a job. So I, I don't know yeah. exactly other than like, I went to the cat <laughs> office and said, okay, hey, can you print me out everything in town? Right. Cool, here you go. Right. We went through it. Now we're visually inspecting every single house. Yeah. So would that suffice or am I going to get kickback from TCEQ when I go to submit it? Again, investigative, uh, and get investigative method is approved, um, but the, the requirement from the EPA is that the public water system make a good faith effort to identify and review all available historical record information. If it's not there, then it's not there, but you must make a good faith effort to review everything. Uh, hi, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to digress just a second back to where we were a little earlier. You were talking about the service lines, uh, the one that unknown, in the first round, if you find one that is truly unknown, then that is one of the people that you would notify at the very first. Uh, I know there's some different categories of the like, you know, uh, likely, uh, unlikely led, but unknown. Uh, so any of those categories that would contain unknown, even on the customer side, would require notification in the first round? That's correct. So if we interview any of our water operators, do we have to get them to sign an affidavit, as you mentioned earlier? If you are having a senior personnel or a water operator make a statement at, that it is a water system record now, I would encourage you to have them sign an affidavit or have it in record of some form um, to keep for your records if you ever need to prove that to the regional investigators. But it won't be necessary. It's just... Something that you suggest. Right, right. At this point, we don't have a template or a requirement that, you know, it has to be signed and certified in this language, um, but we would encourage you to have it, you know, in, in a record of some kind. No, at this point, we're not requiring you to submit any historical records to us. You need to keep your historical records that you used for the inventory at your facility for any regional inspections that may happen in the future, but you're not required to submit those historical records to us for review. Uh, I've been taking notes as you've been talking. I had two two point question. I got a four point question. Yes. Yeah, uh, first of all, when uh, I run a mobile home park with an Edwards Well, uh, west of San Antonio, and uh, we've always told the customer that anything on the other side of the meter is their responsibility. Now all of a sudden you're saying, oh no, it's going to be our responsibility. I get that. But my problem is, where does this uh, wildfire stop? In other words, it would say, oh no, now we have to govern your side of the meter too. Um, I think it's going to make them uncomfortable. Yeah, I totally understand your frustration. I got more. Um, but yeah, at this point, EPA is requiring you to you know, identify the material classification on that customer side. Under LCRI proposed, it's saying that PWS must make sure, must in, um, ensure that the um, galvanized requiring replacement or lead is replaced. Not necessarily that you have to pay for it, but that you must um, make sure that it is completely replaced. Okay. Um. What happens if we have to post or if we have to have available this uh, complete form where we've done the complete investigation, have record of everybody, and you say we have to, when, when requested, we're supposed to give it to whoever requests it. Is that, in, and I'm not sure what, what all information is on the form, but is there a privacy violation in there anywhere? Are people going to be pointing fingers and go, that house has lead, that house has lead? I mean... People are people. It's a great question. Um, yeah, EPA has not addressed that, that issue at this time. Um, of course, we want to ensure that personal and private information is kept confidential, um, but also ensure that consumers are made aware and have the right to know um, their material classification of their service line. We go, we go and we, we uh, find uh, the, the lines are clear or we fix whatever's wrong and we send that in. We have our report on hold for anybody that wants it. We're done. No kickbacks. We're done. Okay. How do I guarantee in the future that somebody doesn't go in there and fix their water line with a lead pipe? 
Right, so you should encourage your consumers to, to let you know if there is replacement happening. And under LCRI, once it is finalized, it's going to have other requirements and, uh, and guidance on the consumer communication uh, between who is replacing that. Um, if they are replacing it, they should notify you. Um, there's going to open up a long line of communication between you and the consumer. Okay, I may have okay. just got my five question minutes. answered, but <clears throat> if you're a relatively new system and you're fortunate enough to have no lead service lines and no GR double, GRR, you're done except for reporting. Right, at this time, if you've, if you've completed your lead service line inventory, initial lead service line inventory of all service lines throughout your distribution system and they are all unknown, you submit that to, to us, the TCEQ, and public notification is not required if it's all non-lead. Right, galvanized that you know has is downstream of non-lead is just non-lead. Um, so galvanized requiring replacement is only a galvanized that is downstream of lead or unknown material. So one of the issues that we run across is we've got some older areas, and I can go back. We have some records going back in the '60s that we put copper in. That's all. We, even when we've done our inventory to look on both the service side and the homeowner side. The service side's always been copper, mm -hmm. but I don't have plans on everything. Some of this stuff's even been rehabbed. So when I put the copper and galvanized because it's older, it's always going to be galvanized requiring replacement unless you have a plan set. Are we allowed to just maybe hit certain areas where we can dig them up and see if we can find the old service line in there maybe? I don't know. Are you referring to the inventory form that it is auto Calculating, Correct. Correct. yeah. So um, I would check on. I believe it's column K um, that if you have a galvanized on either the customer or uh, public side, it's going to put galvanized requiring replacement unless you fill out column K, which is has the public side ever been led, and you need to fill that out in order for it to properly calculate. Correct. But if you've got no plan sets, then. Mm -hmm. How can you really answer that question? Right. If it's unknown, it's going Especially to calculate Especially if it's been it rehabbed already and it's got PVC now or it's got copper again. Right. So if, you, if, you, if it's unknown upstream of galvanized, it is going to calculate as GRR. Is that the question? Am I understanding your question correctly? No, maybe. I'm, basically, I'm just saying I can have copper on the service line, galvanized, on the homeowner side, it's going to say galvanizing and replacement unless you say um, that it's never been led. And Correct. I can't say that if I don't have plan sets right. that it's never been led. Right. If you cannot confirm that it has never been led, then it is going to be galvanized requiring replacement. Yes. Uh, my my question is this. Uh, to validate the lead copper exceedance, Will we have to have the laboratory do an analysis on that water to determine it? And if so, looking at all the customers that would have to have that and connections would have to have that done by a certified lab uh, as a result of, of exceeding those limits. Does that make sense? In other words, does it have to be validated that they've exceeded the limits by a laboratory analysis by a certified lab? All lead in copper compliance samples must be performed by a lab accredited, uh, a lab that is accredited okay, for lead and copper. Yes. And I got a gentleman that's been waiting for okay. some time over here. And I'm gonna let him. Down here. Okay. When we're looking at lead and copper, you say lead and copper lines. Right. How about all the fittings? The fittings? Um, at this point, the initial lead service line inventory is not requiring um, the inventory of fittings. So eventually though, or connectors. As, as this goes on and on and on and the government keeps getting involved, uh -huh. we're eventually gonna have to dig up every single line because all the older fittings were made with lead. Right, it, dip, it depends on what LCRI says. Um, so lead and copper rule improvements, um, if that's finalized and says that they're going to require um, the inventory of all connectors with the baseline inventory, then yes, that will be required, but that is all dependent on what is in the LCRI. Thank you. Okay, okay folks, more. I think we've run out of time here. I understand no, that we're, we're at the end. Okay. okay. Yes? Um, I will also, I'll also be available in the TA room, um, and there is the workshop this afternoon from 3.30 to 4.15 in the Sabine meeting room. Um, you can come find me or Seth Kramer or Laura Higgins down here, and we can answer any additional questions you may have. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it.